Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program created in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Mark Saddam, who heads the Technology Opportunities and Ventures Office at NYU. Um, so welcome. We, uh, my name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We're thrilled you're here to join us for another edition of our virtual breakfast series. Uh, I'm almost sure that not a week goes by where we don't talk about the importance of our academic medical institutions to our ecosystem. So today we um, have an expert in Mark who's joining us. So we're really excited to to talk to him and drill down um, about some of the issues facing um, tech transfer offices, as well as some of the amazing new uh, work that they're doing, right, with um, to spin out discoveries uh, and platforms from their institutions. Um, as always, please, I know you're going to have questions for Mark today, so please put those in the chat or the Q&A, and Derek and I will get to them during the course of our conversation. A special thanks to our sponsor for this month, Cooley. Um, we are very much looking forward to the discussion. And with that, I'll kick it over to Derek to get us started. Thanks. All right. Mark, good morning. It's great morning. to have you here. A, a belated welcome to New York. You've, you've now been uh, the, the head here for, for about eight months. It's good to see that you're settling in. Uh, we're excited to get going. This literally has everything. You've got entrepreneurship, you've got academic deal making, you've got innovation, you've got policy. Who could ask for anything more? So as we usually get started, we tend to have a, uh, a bit of an origin story, but we kind of don't want you to give away too much. So why don't you talk a little bit about uh, kind of your, your early career, how you got into tech transfer, and you know, really kind of some of the progression as you moved from one place to another. Sure. So just to, to get the elephant out of the room, the last name is Saddam, like the car. I used to joke that I was going to name my kids Four Door and Luxury so people would remember how to, <laughs> how to say my last name. Then I had two girls and that didn't seem like such a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> they, so, they might have so come I'm back done. to haunt you later. <laughs> it, they, yeah, let's leave that where it says. Um, yeah, so, so I've, been in, I've been in tech transfer, to, uh, in my definition of tech transfer, which is very broad and very holistic for... Yeah you know, just about 20, 25, 26 years. So I started, um, actually started as a research scientist, uh, a food scientist, doing things to corn that God didn't intend. So um, you're, if you've eaten a power bar, you've eaten some of my research, it makes me feel better in, in some way. <laughs> but, the, but the story of how I got to tech transfer it is, would, would be fairly traditional, who's my age, which is, it was totally random. So I moved from New Jersey to North Carolina to follow my uh, girlfriend, now wife, and didn't have a job, didn't know what to do. The only person we knew in Chapel Hill was her, my father-in-law's tennis partner, who happened to be the head of tech transfer at UNC Chapel Hill. And so I went to him to just ask, I'm, I'm a researcher, help me find a lab, what's the world like? And he said, well, I, I, need, a, I need some help. So I started as a temp filing <laughs> paperwork and, and uh, for the people in my office who are listening, uh, f filling out the database, putting data in the database. Yeah. And so for, for eight or 10 months, I just sat there with, with every document. We were digitizing the office. Yeah. Looking after license, after license, after license. And it was kind of fascinating. <laughs> so in, in terms of training, I don't think anybody would agree to do it originally, but you know, I wound up reading about 300 license agreements in eight months and kind of got the cadence of what it was and what we were doing. Yeah. Nobody asked me to, I just, it was interesting. So I was, instead of just putting the data in, I was just reading them. And yeah. so when, you know, 10 months went by and he said, do you want a job? I said, oh, I think I already know how to do at least a little yeah. bit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so I was hired in there and I was at, I was at Chapel Hill for eight years. So um, eventually getting to the point where I was the, effectively the head of the life sciences practice, if you want to call it that. Um, and back then, that was, so I was there from 96 to 2004, we were one of the most aggressive universities in startup formation. So we led the country in startup formation in, I think, 2001, and we did 12. When 12 is a lot now, and back in yeah. 2001, we did yeah. 12. Um, uh, so it was just something that kind of, we started to get good at. We started to understand how to make them work. We were really aggressive about it, meaning deals that we would insist on, we would not be able to do today. <laughs> so the, the bar was really high. 
Uh, and for those of you who've done tech transfer, we, we mandated that the company have the financing in place already before we would sign a license. Like they had to have the, the venture group, everything was done and the license agreement and the financing and everything was signed at the same time in a big three hour meeting. So you can imagine how that would go over today. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but the yeah, flip no. side was stuff was, <laughs> they, they were, the hit rate was really great because if you couldn't meet that hurdle, we yes. didn't do a startup. So, you know, our hit rate was really good with Inspire Pharmaceuticals and, and companies like that. So mm -hmm. um, then I, I kind of got the bug and had everybody who does commercialization inside a university has their baby as the technology that they love more than any other technology. And I fell in love with a suite of technologies and really tried to, tried to make it happen. And um, the, the original story was we were, we were set up to get it financed on uh, September 10th, 2011, or 2001. Uh, and the financing was supposed to be signed the following day and that didn't happen. So it was about a two or three year period for us to rebound from that. And then the company got spun out and I didn't, I just was happy that it got started. And about a month later, the CEO called and said, we don't understand IP and you did all this stuff for eight years. Why, why don't you come and join us? Right. So I switched, right. switched sides and went to the company. Um, and that was, we could talk about that later. That was kind of humbling to have to live up to your own license agreement. <laughs> so, so I was there for, I was really, there for eight years. It, it really puts things in perspective when you're like, oh God, why did we agree to this clause? When you're the person that wrote the clause, it's, it's a difficult, uh, you kind of can't do that one. Uh, although it works in your favor, because when, when I had to, a discussion about a disagreement in the license and the university said, well, this clause says this, I said, I know what it means. I wrote it. <laughs> you know, and, and I got it. And, and the, the director of the office at the time was a friend of mine said, you get that once. That's your one time. You can use that. <laughs> Next time, it doesn't matter what you meant. It matters how we interpret what you did. Yes, exactly. It's so, the current uh, interpretation that is the yeah, controlling view. That's right. Yeah. I, so I think um, you can only play that card once. They, they let me, it was all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was there for, I was at the startup for eight years called Qualist. Um, I was there for eight years. I ran four years as well. There was no CEO. Um, that's a beer conversation, but I, I did that for, for four years um, to the point where it just stopped being fun and went to, went to look for something to do. And the next week, my alma mater, UNH, um, had a position open. So I applied and got that job and was there for much longer than I expected. I was there for mm -hmm. 10 years, the last uh, two of which I built and uh, sort of operated the COVID lab, which was not tech transfer, but I actually, we didn't have a lab. We went from zero to CLIA in a hundred days with oh, no yeah. infrastructure at all. Um, wow. And, and, and wound up, I think the university just finished their, their millionth test um, and they're testing schools. And if you have kids that go to camp in New Hampshire, we tested them for COVID. You know, right. nursing homes, care facilities, all that stuff. So um, almost like you built a state testing lab. We even did. Though it was the yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. So that we was, could spend a whole hour on this. Well, I think we have spent an hour on that before, but honestly, a year ago, this would have been great to have you on for that. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was, it was, that's a, a story for another day, but it was, it was a good experience yeah. and built on the lab. And then you know, just about the time that stopped being fun. Actually, it was never really fun, but it was important to do. Yeah. Um, the opportunity in way came up and, and it was very quick. It was about 10 days from the time that I heard about the position to, to uh, was hired. Wow, that's fast. That's fast. So especially, to, before that we, seems before, especially fast for academia. <laughs> yeah, I, I really. think it, it says something about how Langone Health and NYU are thinking about this. Right. So before we get to New York, I actually want to talk a little bit about kind of the differences between your your kind of first two stints. Really, it, it's interesting. You have two you have two different universities. You have two two separate kind of cultures and things like that. And you also have your own experience, which changed in between the two of them. So, what were some of the things that you took kind of that you took away the second time, and how much of it was was the culture different at the institution, and how much of it was I already did this for eight years in another place. I kind of know the way that things are going to go here. Yeah. So this is um, this is kind of the thing that I when you when you start a tech transfer office, people will say, "Oh, we want to be like you know, yeah, Harvard or MIT or yeah. NYU or Columbia or whomever." Right. The job in a smaller university is not has nothing to do with the job in a bigger university. So when I was at Chapel Hill, 
you know, we had regular contact with VCs. We had uh, industry was calling us. People knew the science. Our scientists were published in great journals, right? And I go to UNH, uh -huh. and, and it was different because UN, UNC was dominated by medicine, and um, UNH did not have a med school, a vet school, or a school of pharmacy. So as a life sciences guy, I went to a, a place that had very limited life sciences. Mm -hmm. And but we were publishing in those same journals, but industry wasn't calling. And the venture community, I used to joke that the Charles River was the river Styx. You know, money never got over, died on the way over, and it yeah. never made it. To me. <laughs> and, you know, so, so the job was really different. So what was interesting, though, was unlike Chapel Hill, um, I got to build it from scratch, evidenced mm -hmm. by eight years in industry, which was a startup right. from a university. So, yeah. you know, like we were talking about before, you know, I, that license agreement that I signed to the startup that I eventually ran, I renegotiated that license four times. And in each time, Derek, you said it, it was, why did I say this? This doesn't make any sense at all. And why am mm -hmm. I, and, and then you start realizing things like how a company gets paid, the business model of the company, services versus products versus something else, it really starts to play into the license agreement and what, you know, simple yeah. things like, is it net 30, 60 or 90 on payment? Did they get their money? What does the license agreement say when a royalty is due? So right. having lived it and realized all the things that I was doing wrong at a very good tech transfer office, and it's nobody's fault. This is the, this is the reason why I think it's good for people to bounce back and forth across the industry university um, veil, as it were, yep. is when I got to UNH, I intentionally kind of inverted the office. And I said, instead of building an office at a university that's trying to work with industry, I tried to build an office that was industry facing first and then tried mm -hmm. to figure out how to make it fit into the university setting. So we really just took the complete opposite approach. It was, what does the world need? And then how do right. we work backwards into our culture so that the line was pretty direct between the two? Um, yeah. And that really did help. Uh, we were able to do some things, some really creative stuff, like we created an online licensing platform, which we'll re which we're reproducing at NYU, where for non-exclusive software, you know, kind of technologies that we'll license over and over again, it's like Amazon. You go online, you say, I want that software, you swipe a credit card, and you've licensed it, and a human doesn't touch yeah. it. Right. So we can get to scale without having to put a lot of FTE behind it. So because yeah. we had to, we had to think about ways to do it, because nobody was knocking on our doors. So the way that we got to be good at what we did yeah. was we were the friendliest, fastest, most direct yeah. office that we could be. Um, and, that, you know, and that kind of panned out because I, I think it was 2016. We, we were third in the country and start in uh, licenses and we did more licenses than Harvard and MIT combined at UNH. Wow. Wow. So that year, that year, so. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But it's just, we just tried to pick a different business model because a UNC or an NYU or a Harvard business model doesn't work at UNH. And you yeah, had there, there's that. something. I was gonna say, you had the intellectual talent and the intellectual property. You just had to make sure other people, the buyers yeah. knew about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a great, it's a great university. We had, we had technology on every space mission since 1956. We're, we're the folks that mapped to the bottom of the ocean floor, like the Marianas Trench. We did all sorts of stuff. So, you know, there was real heavy science there, but we just had to approach it a different way. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can kind of rip the page out of the playbook where you really kind of cater to the Nobel laureates at the institution and spend a lot of your resources trying to figure out where stuff, if you don't have several Nobel laureates at the institution, you do kind of have to have a little bit of a different playbook. We're scrappy. <laughs> That's okay. You 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 bend the model to what you are. It's much better That's than right. trying to uh, to completely re recreate things. So, yeah. all right. So when you actually so, ten days between hearing about NYU and and coming to uh, coming to New York. So, uh, you know, what were some of your? How did that go? I have a bunch of other questions, but that's really really fast. How did that go? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you know, it was it was a, a search firm, but I think, you know, I, I'd like to think that it was, you know, right person, right fit, right institution, right time. You know, the mm -hmm. things, the skills that I think I bring to the table are things that will be highly useful at, at uh, NYU. And we're already seeing, you know, we're changing some of the things we're doing. We're taking some of the playbook that, we, that I brought with me from UNH and 
our licensing platforms and our data and um, to really drive things that are not biotech, but digital and creative works, which is, you know, how do we get the entire institution to participate and use things like trademarks and copyrights. So, you know, I, I, and I just think the, you know, I've always been somebody who just tries to uh, get something done. My, my friend, Julie Lenzer, who's a, we used to be the CIO at um, University of Maryland, who's now at Army and one of the biofab facilities up at, she calls it team GSD and you can decide what the S is. So, you know, it's, I think it was just the, you know, the pace. I'm familiar that like, with that acronym. <laughs> there you go. So that, you know, the pace that I'd like to work at and the, um, the things that I think that I can bring to the table are, we're, we're just really great fits. Um, you know, and then personally, when I was thinking about where to go next after UNH, I, I guess I'm very didactic. I took a list and I said, well, it's gotta be a university that kind of looks like this. It's a Carnegie R1. It should have over half a billion in or half a million, half, half a billion in research should be in one of these three areas. And there are about six universities on the list because I really was mm -hmm. pretty happy at UNH. Um, and NYU was one of those things on the list. And, and, and I looked at that when I made my list, I went, well, that's never gonna happen. Uh, yeah. Just because I couldn't, I couldn't really conceive of it. But it's despite, good to have stretch goals, Mark. Stretch. That's goals. right. Yeah. Dis, despite being born in New Jersey, it just didn't. It just, I don't know. It just didn't seem like something that was more likely than less likely. And you know, here we are. Yeah. So before you came to New York, this is this is a good one. So a, what were your, what were some of your uh, kind of preconceived notions about New York City in the in the ecosystem, and uh, what were you right about? What were you wrong about? So I paid attention to New York for lots of different reasons. One is just, again, I grew up in New Jersey, so I was always pretty interested in the life sciences and that that line from Pennsylvania, from the suburbs of Pennsylvania all the way through New York City up to up to New Haven. It's just something that I paid attention to. When I went, um, when I worked at Qualys, I was here all the time. I was going through, I was going to Regeneron, I was going to all the, all the, the pharma and biotechs in the region. Yeah. So I was pretty, pretty familiar with it. What I, what I don't think I appreciated was the, the, how strong of an effort is being made to, to have the life sciences community a significant contributor to the region. Yeah. Now, finance is, you know, everybody knows finance. Some of the buildings behind me are NYU, but some of them are not, right? So we all understand that. And the, it's a pretty heavy lift to build a life sciences community in a place that you know, isn't one of those origin stories of life sciences like the research triangle. So I've just been really thrilled to see how many people are trying to push this, including NY Bio. Um, how many how many people in the community are willing to work together to try to get stuff done? Um, that was one of the things, probably one of the weaknesses of the Greater Boston ecosystem, is it is a little balkanized. So it's like, what's good for me is good for me. Uh, here, there's much more of a community, which I really appreciate. It's much more like Research Triangle, um, which is which is what I love. So I would say those are the, those are the big things I've I've seen. And and then what do you think about so like talk to us a little bit more about kind of how you expect to take how do you expect NYU and your office to contribute to that ecosystem right as you think about the community was is a little more welcoming maybe than Boston and so talk about where you see NYU's place in that. Sure. So I think to start first, the, the, the staff that was at NYU is exceptional. And the people that were there, you know, when I got here were exceptional. And when I say we did this and we did that, I didn't do any, you know, <laughs> everybody here, everybody here did all that work, you know, Abram Goldfinger, Sada Chidley and uh, Bob Fector and lots of folks in, in our office. They're probably the most talented licensing people I've ever met. And they're, they are just exceptional at what they do. Um, we're doing 17, 18 startups a year. Um, which is a lot. <laughs> so, so I think to, to sort of directly answer your question, when you look at the underlying data about NYU's contribution, it's incredibly significant. And I think it's really not well known. So, so some of it is just saying, hey, did you have any idea we did all this stuff already? So I think everybody's, well, most people are familiar with Remicade, which, is, which was a, a discovery out of the, the med school at, at NYU, uh, now Langone Health. It was one of the, the grand slams in the history of the United States in terms of technology commercialization, bringing in royalties of, you know, well over a billion dollars in royalties. So, so generally that kind of keep, puts you and keeps you on the map, but I think people just, you know, it becomes old news after a while. And then we had done 
you know, other licenses of, that were in, in most universities would be seen as home runs, but here it was like a triple, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and like I said, I think the, we, we led, uh, we were, no, not led, we were number eight in the country in startup formation in the last three years. We did 52 startup companies in the last three years. You know, about a little more than half of those are in the life sciences. So, you know, how are we going to contribute? Well, we'll just keep doing that and hopefully do a lot more. But the the data point that I like to use a lot is there are some there are some heuristics in tech transfer and commercialization in the United States. So uh, this comes from the Autumn data. I was the chair of Autumn two years ago. That you get usually get an invention disclosure for every two three million in research, a patent application for every ten million or five million, and then a license for every ten million. The revenue is not connected to any of that behavior, but generally speaking, that works. Public, private, rural, urban, you know, land grant doesn't matter where yeah. you are. That heuristic kind of works. And for for NYU, the license data is pretty spot on. The patent data is pretty spot on, but the disclosure rate is low. So we get about half the disclosures that we would expect to see based on the research base. So the answer to sort of how we contribute is, is somewhat straightforward, which is we're gonna build out a, um, a, a bigger infrastructure to go and find every idea of merit on campus funded by research. So we should be at you know, 400 or 450 disclosures. So if you think about those outputs where we're already in the top 10 in the country in many of these outputs and we overperform res with respect to the research base on startups on 40% of the inputs. So if we can just lift the inputs to what's already there and, and talk to people and, and continue to talk the, the language of commercialization, I would suspect that the rest of those numbers, I don't think it's linear, but they'll certainly go up. But they'll go up. Yeah. Yep. So we have a uh, we have a, we have a, a a peaking question here from uh, from the audience. So Arthur Arthur Klausner says, if you had a choice of doing ten licensing deals with middle of the road terms for the university versus three deals with great terms for the university, which would you prefer? And would your team be unsurprised by your answer? Wow, that's a good one. <laughs> yes. Arthur so, hosts the game show on Thursdays. Yeah, the same I know. We've, we've, we've met. Thank you, Arthur. That was I know. Really I'm sure you have. Yeah, you, you know. So I would probably, honestly, choose the the latter. More licenses with you know slightly lesser terms. I would say. Mm. Now, the the, <laughs> the 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 thing about that is we usually have an N of one in terms of licensees. So it's not like we're negotiating against three people and have the luxury of picking right. terms. But you know, I view, I fundamentally view the job of what we do is getting ideas into the world. Yeah. So, you know, the more ideas we get in the world, the more chances there are to make societal impact. And then our job is to be able to wrap a good solid business model around mm -hmm. the, the impact. And so if you if you get the if you get the impact, if you get treat humans, if you make human health better and you have a good business model, you're gonna generate, you know, the revenue that that you earn. Right? shared value, right. shared return. If you don't make impact, you can't make revenue. So, I mean, you can, but it's sort of hollow and it's not really that much. You, know, you don't make over a billion dollars in royalties for a technology that didn't sell, right? Yeah. So right. we choose, I, I choose to think about how do we get as many of our ideas into the world as possible under terms that have shared, you know, that represent shared value. Because if I was smart enough to pick winners, I'd have done it already. So, yeah. you know, so, so I, I'm a big fan of portfolio theory. Now that said, where there's real value and where we know we have a huge platform or we've got some really killer science, you know, we're going to push for a fair deal, which would be yeah. elevated terms. And, you know, one of the things that I think we'll talk about in a little bit are ways that we can think about increasing the value of what we transfer out to the world before it gets transferred versus just, you know, trying to get it get it out there quick. Well, there are some situations where we might slow down a little, de-risk it internally. And when we bring it out, we've really proved, uh, we've de-risked it more and we've really proven some value. Yeah. And are there certain well, segments of the um, investment community that prefer something that's more de-risked versus the early stage? How, how do you oh, find the recipient? I think everyone would like the least <laughs> amount of risk possible, right? No, <laughs> yes, I think, thank you, you know, very much. <laughs> There, you know, there, there are firms that, that prefer seed investments that understand 
the technical risk. There, there are firms that don't want to participate until you know you filed an IND and and you know are a little farther along the path. But I think what's what's beautiful about New York is there's plenty of all of them. So we you know we have regular conversations with the venture community, not just in the city but nationally. And mm -hmm. you know we feel like there's a there's a great number of choices where depending on where the technology is to find investors including us because we have a we have a venture fund so yeah. we can sometimes we can be the person who's putting the money in yeah and from what you said before we actually uh we had nadine shodi on a couple months ago i think you're i think the formation of the the ota that basically took those kind of right. middle of the road projects, de-risk them or whatever. I think that's one of the, the great things that's happened in, in academia. And you guys were certainly uh, a leader in that. I don't know if you were the first university to do it, but I think a lot of the universities have followed in your footsteps. And you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of kind of the innovation pendulum, if you will, has swung very far onto the side of academia, right? There's It's almost a realm where the, the PI is far more important than the startup CEO, right? Especially at, at the seed stage. And it swings a lot of that importance and power back onto the side of the academic institution. So, you know, do you feel like that's made kind of in-baked startups a little larger fraction of what you try to do uh, over the last however long? Does it change the strategy about how you think about those? It, it does a little bit. I would. I guess I would look at this slight. I'll flip this a little bit, Derek, and say mm -hmm. what I think. Ha what I think has happened over the last five years, and has certainly happened since COVID, was the value of science, not the value of yep. the product, but the value of solid science. We're not hopefully coming out of a pandemic if academic science wasn't the powerhouse that it was, and that the quality science could be. We could just invest a pile of money into the best science you could find. To drive a solution, and you know, if you would have said, if you would have said, you know, in 2018, there's going to be a pandemic, but we're going to have three vaccines within 10 months and two therapeutics no six months later, everybody would have told you you were nuts, right? No but one it, would have believed you. Yeah. And and what I think it did, and I've I've talked to colleagues around the country about this, is I think it reminded big pharma that powerful science really met, still matters. There there was this separation of. Of, you know, the, everyone talks about the valley of death. Yeah. The valley of death was because a lot of the, the pharma and biotech companies started to want things more de-risked before it got to them. So they were like, you know, what they used to fund basic research and they used to have internal DMPK groups and things like that. They're like, yeah, you know what we're good at? We're good at developing drugs and marketing drugs. And they started to lose the, the muscle memory of early stage science and discovery. And I think what happened during COVID was everybody remind, remembered that understanding the basic science and understanding the origin of the therapeutics that happen is really critical for moving quickly. So what I think I've actually seen, and, and so I'm, I'm violently agreeing with you, Derek, but just maybe for a slightly different reason, is that mm -hmm. there is this, this respect for you know, early stage academic research, blue sky research, that if we can match the, the inquiry that happens in academia and direct it in a way that the you know, industry is sitting out there saying, and if you if you point this way, we can really help bring it to market with you as a collaboration versus you know toss it over the transom. Um, yeah, that I think that there's been a recognition of that, and so we're seeing. It was just that autumn where there's great partnering forums and, and bios coming up soon. We're seeing industry say we'd actually like to look a little earlier, and we'd like to look a little earlier, and now we have corporate venturing yeah. and. And that the valley is always going to be there, but maybe the bridge is a little bit stronger than it used to be. Yeah, we've actually yeah, like, we've had conversations with some of our larger pharma members that are putting more resources into their venture. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, even within the the last six months, we're hearing yep. that. So, yeah, yep. it's interesting. You can think back to you know a time where you know you did have much more of this blue sky research in academia, but the transfer and commercialization environment was not the same, right? Now, virtually every single every single university has an active tech transfer office. Yeah. Every single university wants to build these bridges with industry. And, you know, I think that's really, really healthy because now you have this, you don't, you don't really have an, an environment where the good stuff kind of sits in this corner and no one recognizes it. I think there are a lot right. of efforts to make sure that the good stuff is seen, heard about, talked about, 
and you really explore all options. You know, is there a biopharma licensing option? Is there a startup uh, venture option, right? So in addition to your discussions with industry, can you talk a little bit about how you kind of manage relationships with venture groups, whether it's with your office, whether it's directly through uh, PIs, you know, how do you actually, how do you play in that dynamic, right? Because a lot of that, a lot of that dynamic is personal, right? The, the venture group is interested yeah. in the research of the PI. How do, you, how do you handle that from the standpoint of a tech transfer office? Yeah, and, and again, I wanna give a lot of uh, all the credit uh, to Abram, Bob and Sana in the office who were driving those relationships. And there are other people, mm -hmm. but they're sort of the three senior most people in the office. But I think it's a constant discussion. So we, we have a regular conversation with the venture groups in the region and nationally every week i mean i can't i honestly mm. can't think of a, a, a two-week period since i've been at nyu where there wasn't a discussion between somebody in the office and a, and a venture group and a lot of what i like to do is just ask open-ended questions you know where what are you doing now what are you interested yeah. in what's your model how has it changed how do you see what we do and some of what we're building internally building out and accelerating because some of it certainly was already there are based mm -hmm. on those conversations. So how can we be more nimble internally with what we do? Now, what, again, what's interesting here uh, and was true in Chapel Hill, but not in New Hampshire, was that our faculty know a lot of them. And in fact, right. um, you know what we yes. see a lot, and I'm sure the universities in the city also see, is that um, the faculty members' relationships with individual <laughs> venture funds are, could be better than ours. In some cases, definitely are better than ours. And they're walking in the door mm -hmm. saying, I have this new idea. And oh, by the way, I've already have somebody who might be interested in it. And oh, by the way, we might have a, a leader for the organization. And to which I say, this is great. You know, if, if, if those, you know, so we're, we're, I, we try to make things very supportive. It's not everything has to shove through our door first before anything happens. We're just trying to keep things moving. Um, and the pace of licensing and the pace of firm formation for us is really pretty exceptional. And we did eight, I think 17 or 18 startups last year. I don't remember which one. That's one every three weeks. So we're doing yeah. a startup company every three weeks. So yep. you know, we just have to keep the ball moving, the pace moving. So to, to try to take too much control over that process, mm -hmm. I think would be foolhardy. We'd slow stuff down. Um, where we like to just make sure is that everybody understands the breadth and depth of the IP, what the relationship is with the university. Conflicts are a real problem, especially in an academic medical center where they're not a problem. They're just, they exist. And in an yeah. academic medical center, they're more significant because you have patient care that gets involved that you might not have in another university. So there's a lot of vetting of the opportunities through multiple lenses. And, and, and that's probably the headwind in any university is the conflicts process, making sure there's transparency through it, making sure people understand what is and isn't okay. Um, and that can, you know, that just, it's a little harder than if you just were pulling a science from, you know, some independent scientist and saying, let's go, you could just go. But we, we have a lot more checks and balances, which are, which is appropriate to make sure that the, the science is good, the, the postdocs and graduate students are taken care of and respected and are able to matriculate and all that kind of stuff. So what is your, also, oh, okay, yeah. so along those lines, what is your average time from sort of making a connection, right, um, to start talking about spinning out a company and actually finishing? So if you're doing one every three weeks, you, you're, you, you've still got a ton of prep work to do for that, yeah. right? I mean, I think they're wildly different. And some of them, some of them can take a couple of months, you know, a couple of months and some of them are 14, 16 months, not because we're trying to go slow, but because you start to realize you get a little feedback and you say, hmm, well, yeah. you know, not not quite there yet, or the market switches on you, or you know, we're 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 only in control of our ability to turn around those agreements quickly and make sure that everybody understands the relationships. There's a lot of different pieces. You know, but I, I think the the idea is that when things come in to our group, that we turn them around as quick as is reasonable. And that we're never, mm -hmm. it doesn't go into the, and trust me, I've worked in this world for a long time. It doesn't go into the academic black hole and nobody knows what happens to it. <laughs> yes. Really trying to, yeah. trying to focus on, you know, making sure that nobody yes. ever asks where it is. Yeah. Cause that's a thing. <laughs> that's a real thing. It is. A, yeah. But that's like we earned it. I'm thing. not, not, not we NYU. Definitely yeah. not us. We've no, always done everything. <laughs> but, 
No, I mean, Academus Everyone definitely else. earned that. Yeah, we've earned that reputation in places. But um, what I like to do when people say that, oh, you're slow in this, I'll say, well, when was the last time you interacted with the office? Uh, the average time was 15 years ago. So, you know, not at oh NYU, gosh. but when I ask people that, yes, it's like, well, yes. in 1997, I tried to do something that was really hard. I'm like, well, cool. We didn't yeah. have the internet. Like, what do you want? Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> so, internet didn't exist. <laughs> we're, 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 I think, universe, like across the country, there's, it, it is a profession now, as opposed to a thing that was done. And yes. that's been an important distinction. Yeah, we have uh, so we have a couple of, of things to get to, but I just want to get a couple of things off the uh, off things. So one, we have a question that says, "What's the bit? What's the best way to get in your, in touch with your office for uh, either devices or digital health or digital therapeutics?" So that is, I'll I'll put that one in the in the chat. So or I think I okay. will. Yeah, chat. Um, uh, Bob Fector is the guy who runs that whole part, um, and we've got lots of technology. Um, I will also say, as a, I don't know whether it's a plug or whatever you want to call it, but we have, a, we have an opening for a licensing manager in digital health. So if anyone's out there and would love to work for NYU, <laughs> um, by all means, please apply. We, we have a ton, of inf a ton of technology in digital health, and we need somebody to focus pretty much exclusively yeah. on that. Yeah. So we had another question from, uh, from Ben Mumf Mumford, who, which is, you know, what is your marketing strategy to attack to attract license licensors to your portfolio of inventions, right? And, and here I imagine we can think about really kind of some of the assets of NYU as an institution, right? Large medical center, innovative faculty, et cetera. So what are some of the ways that you try and bring industry and bring potential licensors into the discussion? Yeah, so it's, a, it's fairly similar to the way that we deal with the venture groups, which is it's a constant conversation. You know, we try to uh, and we'll, as the world opens back up again, and we can all see three-dimensional humans, you know, we try to go out and and go and do the. You know, we'll go to bio, we'll go to NY bio, we would autumn, and you know, we tr we try to have conversations with people before we have something to see where the needs are and how they're shifting. There, there's something that I'd like to bring uh, to NYU when again when when the restrictions are lifted and we can all get together that I did at UNH was we 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 used to call them sand pits. And we would pick a topic like we we pick marine sciences, right? But you could pick mm -hmm. neurology. Yeah. And we would invite every faculty member who was interested in that space, every industry person that we knew that was interested in the space. And we did 90 minute, it was like speed dating. It would say our fact we'd ask our faculty who you are, what do you do, and what what problems do you like to solve? And we'd ask industry who you are, what your what you know, what you do, and what are the three biggest problems that you have that you're trying to solve. And we would just get people in a room and have them have those conversations. And on average, I think we would do six to 700 indistinct conversations in a three hour period. So that's a great way because we try not to control the discussion. We just let our faculty talk to people. You hear it, people make notes. Um, and that was a very effective way in a, in a fairly fun environment to, to get people to understand what we do. So you know, we'll do that. The, the rest of it is, you know, it's a contact sport. So our licensing managers and business managers are calling, interacting with industry all the time, trying to titrate. Um, the biggest thing, again, I think I've seen, and this is to the advantage of NYU because our science is so wonderful, is that it really is at the point where the science sells more than the business sells. Back in the day, it used to be, where's your marketing summary? Do you even know what you're looking for? Now it really is, often the industry knows the science before we know that it's really right. interesting. So yeah. it's, it's almost as common to have somebody from industry say, hey, I read this paper, what are you doing with this? Or, I, or mm -hmm. when we approach them, they say, yeah, we've been tracking this for 18 months. Mm -hmm. Good, let's have a conversation. So it yeah. really is a constant bubbling froth of activity most days. So we've, we've spent some time talking about NYU and how you all interact within the community. Talk to us about the importance of developing a national sort of a policy environment that supports tech transfer, you know, writ large across the U.S. and what steps are being taken to. Yeah, there's a couple, there's a couple good things and a couple bad things that are going on right now. I think the, the, the first point that I want to make sure everybody understands. So we've talked about how this works well, what, how do we improve, what do we do better? There is zero federal dollars in tech transfer. The US is the only country in the developed world 
that does not directly fund the commercialization of science. Like not one dollar, whatever somebody's thinking, how about this? It's not that. <laughs> so, so every other country in the world that does this great, the UK, uh, Belgium, strangely enough, um, Israel, they are, they are spending money on the infrastructure of commercialization. So we jokingly in tech transfer call it the great unfunded mandate. So many people have heard of Buy Dole, which was Bob Dole and yeah. Birch Buy in 1980. Mm -hmm. They said, you should do this. Have a nice day. And there was no, so <laughs> let us this, know how it goes. Yeah. Right. So all of this activity, um, I think the last autumn numbers were something like, uh, there were like 18,000 disclosures across the United States. There's thousands of, there was over a thousand startup companies that came out hundreds of products, six or 700 products from industry, from university research without a dollar of support from the federal government to make right. it work. So the reason that I say that is that there is uh, a bill under consideration. It's been long stalled, but I think there's some activity going on called USICA. It used to be Endless Frontier. Um, and in that, there is some language in there about um, supporting tech transfer directly to the tune of a million dollars a year, having the federal government give the universities a million dollars a year to support the academic uh, commercialization of science, which is great. And I. Uh, I told you guys before, I know it's in there because I wrote it. So it's uh, <laughs> was asked to, Autumn was asked, when I was chair, Autumn was asked to, to contribute, like what would be a great idea? And we, you know, we said, we said to the federal government, do you know that you don't support this at all? And the response was, we don't. And so as we had those discussions, it was, you know, this, this is really important. You know, if, if you want this to go better, faster, quicker, then somebody has to provide the resources. Um, and indirect cost rates in universities, the, uh, the administrative rate in university hasn't changed since 1991. So that's 11 years after Baidol started and they said, yeah. no more administrative fees, right? But here is all this work and um, economic output that's been un unsupported. So that's out there. So, it, you know, I know we're all in New York and we all know who to call, um, but it's, it's important that you still talk to your government relations people and talk, make sure they're aware of it and that they're supporting that. There, there is bipartisan support around that because every state in the country has research universities. Every state in the country wants to commercialize science and every state in the yeah. country wants the jobs in their backyard. And again, the data from Autumn is that something like 73% of all university startups still in operation are in the county they were founded. Okay. So when you think about local and regional economic development, yeah. universities are where it's at, yeah. because if you start a job yeah. there, it's going to stay there because the lab is there, the PI is there, the science is there, the support network is there, and those jobs really stay. And again, I think for New York City and, and the region, this is our strength, right? We have these amazing mm -hmm. medical centers and amazing universities. And yes, relative to the total economy of New York City, it's, it's smaller, but you know, we can create really great jobs that stay in the region because people want them to. Um, well, don't, don't you think it's ahead. also a way to support, to further support the funding from a life sciences perspective that already flows through grants from NIH? That's because right. Because if they're investing in that basic research, they should want to invest in the commercialization ultimately of that research. Yes, yes. And, and you see things in, in, a, in the National Science Foundation has started to put things in grants called broader impacts which is really asking the researchers, hey, do you know where this is going, right? And I'm, right. Sure, I'm sure that NIH will start to have that discussion too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And every university, of course, you know, we have the Entrepreneurial Institute down at the Square. Every university has support around how to teach founders, you know, raise capital. We're all, we've all seen yes. the light on this and realize yeah. that it's, it's part of our service component uh, as, as the university. Right. I was Sorry, I was just answering Question. one other. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to put uh, uh, Robert's name back in back into things. So let's talk a little bit about um, let's talk a little bit about who and how li licenses get done, right? I mean, one of the, the New York City has a lot of strengths, and I think one of the biggest strengths that we have is the diversity of both yeah. the research population, the underlying patient population, and you know, we think about this a lot as New York Bio from a community standpoint, but I think it's something that is appreciated across the industry, which is there are several corners of, uh, of academic research and innovation that really haven't been fully explored for, for one reason or another. 
So you sit on top of a, of a remarkably diverse uh, substrate of research. How do you think about that? How do you think about the way that you pull more innovation out of the uh, out of the research community? Yeah, that's it's a great question, and I think the the quick and straightforward answer is that everyone has to participate, and we're leaving people on the sidelines, not intentionally, um, but you know if. For example, you know, I, I would I would challenge the universities on this, and actually companies too, to look at to look at the the diversity of your employees and your population and your researchers, and then compare that to the patents you file and the licenses you do and the startups you do, and ask yourself, are they the same? If you if you are you know, forty five percent female. Do forty five percent of your disclosures are they from women or forty five percent of your licenses? It doesn't. It could be higher. I'm not saying it can't be mm -hmm. higher, but you know, yeah. is at least forty five percent of your startups are led by women? The, the answer is no. I mean, I can answer it for everybody. The answer is no. But the but the most important thing is to start asking the question, and 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 making sure that you're asking yourself the really hard questions about: Are we being inclusive? Are we do we are we serving the community equally? or equitably that we're here to serve. So mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of work in EDI and i and, and at Autumn, that was kind of the big focus of my time on the board was to create an EDI committee. It was hardwired to the board. We did simple things like yeah, as an organization that presents, uh, you know, like you that presents activities was, yeah. um, you know, we said, we joke and said, no mantles, right? No all male panels, mm -hmm. right? That's not hard. You can make that change yeah. without thinking about it. And then it's, well, our panel's diverse. Well, you can work on that, make those small changes. And, uh, but I've, I've worked with this program with MIT and San Diego State at the Big Bio Convention every year. So this is, I think, year six or year seven, where we train, um, we, it's usually between 40 and 60 people from underrepresented populations in science, and we train them on the commercialization of science. And for those of you that are familiar with i it's actually called bio i <laughs> and and so we do some of the training and then they do customer discovery on the floor of the bio convention which is really fun because every, whatever question you have there's an answer on the floor somebody the is there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so so that's been a, that's been sort of a life changing thing for me to participate in it's completely changed the framework of how i look at what we do and and um, because the the impacts are are it takes very, very short amount of time and effort, but the, impact, the impacts are pretty dramatic. So we've trained two or 300 people. We've had people go into tech transfer, which is of course like, that's great for me, but we've had people start companies. We've had people go into industry who thought they never wanted to go into industry because they realized that there was a, there was a place for them in those communities. And, and I think if I can just tell a very like 30 second story of one of them, we were doing this training in Philadelphia, the last one pre COVID. And we had a, a woman from, she was an early career faculty member, maybe her second year on the faculty, and came in and, and was sort of a, a little standoffish, because um, kind of like not sure what was going on, but was happy to participate. And at the end of three days, she stood up and she said, you know, first of all, I have never been in a room with people that look like me before, like where everybody in the room looked like me. And she started to cry. And she's like, this just being here is powerful. That's great. But the second thing she said was, you know, I'm a researcher, I am a, I'm a faculty member, and I really thought that I wanted nothing to do with industry, that, that industry was not, was not a positive impact on science. And she said, after three days, I realized we're all on the same team. We are all trying to cure human health. Human health. Yeah. And of course, the, the, all the staff are like, we're all just like weeping in the corners because, you know, it came really from her heart. And she just said, this has fundamentally changed how I look at things. And so just in a small three-day session, we're able to teach 60 people the, the generic principles of commercializing science, make sure that um, they feel like that's a, that's a community that they that can participate in. Um, I'm one of the only people that looks like me in the room. Most of the <laughs> mentors are uh, yeah. black and brown. We work with the UNCF is a big partner of ours. And so you know, I'm, I'm trying to bring that same approach into NYU and, and ask questions about that from our own data to make sure that we're asking good questions and putting training in. We're also um, working in my head and soon to be not in my head on some programming to have commercialization fellows from underrepresented populations in the office. 
Um, and we'll be looking to launch something more on a national basis. Or I think Oren's on the call and he's uh, talked to him about it and think it'll be something that we could do as an academic community to try to build the pipeline. Because the question that I hear all the time is where is everyone? Like I want to hire, but I don't know where to go. And my response is we'll build it. We'll figure out how to build the pipeline. We'll work with UNCF, we'll work with Autumn, we'll work with partners, we'll work with NYU and our Institute of Health Equity. And we'll try to find a way to build a pipeline of potential employees that people can say, oh, well, now I know where to go. There's a hundred people over here that um, are interested in this world and let me see how I can help. So, you know, for those on the call who are in the corporate and venture community, I will be calling you. Um, and, and uh, you know, I just, I, I'm just very motivated to try to solve in some small way the problem of inclusion in life sciences, especially in commercialization. It's interesting because this it it flows directly with something that you you said before with uh, in, invention disclosures, right? A lot of what you're talking about is basically trying to open more doors, right? Yeah. You're, it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is just trying to make sure that opportunities can come out of the woodwork, and you know if they get out of the woodwork, they have they have more of a chance of making it to patients, making it into a company, follow, following a different path. Is it fair to say that's kind of a general theme that, that you think follows all the things that you try to do? Yeah, and, and to make sure we're meeting people where they are and not you know, where we are. So mm -hmm. even simple things like if you want to do a program on uh, women, uh, women in the commercialization of science, right? If we try to have it at four o'clock, well, maybe, as, maybe they're the primary caregivers and they have to yeah. go home. Right. So, so even though you're doing the right thing, you're not really paying attention to the community you're trying to serve and asking when would be a good time to do this or should we do it at different times of the day so it can be more participatory. So yeah. it's really a lot about listening and making sure that we understand where people are and that we go to them rather have it than having them come to us. Right. Mm -hmm. I was looking, I okay, look so we have questions. Yeah, that we've yeah, got. Yeah, let's see what else we got here. Um, Oh, th this is a this is a broad question, so you can you can narrow it down. But how do you help form founding teams, given most of the PhDs and researchers don't have a business background? Yeah, that's so. I think about a lot about the, the our scientists. It's it's pretty uncommon to have the the PhD or the postdoc be ready to run a business. I mean, I've seen it a couple of times. It's just not it's not that normal, shall we say. Yeah. So um, a lot of what we're thinking about now is to build out, you know, maybe think about some, some entrepreneur in residence programs if we can. Again, those have been pretty popular with universities. Tap into our alumni network, which is the thing that universities have that no other business model really has. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not, if I, I used to work for uh, a company called Ingredion and nobody, nobody reaches out and says, hey, Ingredion alumni, would you like to help us, you know? <laughs> but, but in our world, you know, we're, People really yeah. do want to give back to the place that that educated them. So, you know, we have the ability to tap in there. And a lot of times, it's the the business lead comes from another place. It can come from a exec that had you know gotten out of a you know successfully gotten out of a yes. startup. Um, again, Frank Rimolovsky down at Washington Square runs a lot of programming that attracts people. Uh, Deepak Hij does the Endless Frontier Lab, and he connects people to. So, a lot of this is just about being open and making sure that if you're in the community and you're thinking about wanting to participate in an early stage life sciences company and you have the experience um, to make sure people know who to call. So the answer is me, right? So <laughs> if you're interested out there, just, just give a shout. Um, and you know, we'll have a conversation about what our needs are. I mean, a lot of our teams kind of come prepackaged a little bit because they have those relationships like we talked about before, but we're, you know, there's never enough money there's never enough talent. There's never enough of everything to be able to, to be able to do everything that we're capable of doing. And then how do you feel, how do you view um, New York? Obviously, like I've only been in the New York community for, I guess, five years now. Right. And it was when I first got here, it was, oh, we don't have enough. We don't have space. Right. We, we just don't have any place to put new companies. And in that time, we've had tremendous growth, right, in this space available for companies to start and grow. How do you think that the offerings like, like um, BioLabs or Alexandria Launch Labs or J Labs, and how do you think that can affect, affect our 
growth as um, an ecosystem? That they're critical. Obviously, it's it's bio labs at NYU Langone, so we agree. You know, they're they're critical. But it's <laughs> you know, it's a lot of the when you do an early as somebody who ran an early stage life sciences company, we were in an Alexandria building as our first launch because we knew the science, but we didn't. We didn't need 100% of the resources. So we had a mass spec, but we didn't need 100% of a mass spec. We need 30% of a mass spec. And so there's facilities, um, and I know Deerfield Cure is another one that's kind of coming up online, is you know, to be able to work in a place that has people who can help answer some basic questions. Because you know, as somebody, again, who ran a small company, the imposter syndrome is real. When you're looking around saying, does anybody know that I'm not quite sure what to do next? Um, but to be mm -hmm. to have that infrastructure and support to point people in the right direction, to have people uh, have the ability to not make simple mistakes, to make, you can make complicated, specific mistakes based on your own yes. idea, yes. but not the basic blocking and tackling of getting something up off the ground is really, really critical. Plus, it's the, it's the, it's the interest, they fill the interstitial space of the connectors and pulling people together. Because if you don't know, you can go to one of these locations, get some training, get some education and understand what's available. And also for us, we love it because it's another point of view. So if we're telling a faculty researcher or a postdoc, this is how we see this is going to go. And they say, well, you're at the university and you don't know, <laughs> they can go out to these places <laughs> and they're probably going to hear the same thing. And if they, yeah. if they don't tell them the same thing, we actually want to know that. So give some positive feedback and, you know, we can learn too. It's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> you're, you're a big boy. <laughs> yeah. So this is, an, this is an odd question to, to end on, but since it's a weird question, I figure I'll, I'll ask it anyway. I said, given your experience with different universities, what do you say to researchers who seek to avoid negotiations with the tech transfer office because they think the VCs want them to avoid a university license? Have you ever had that? Never. Uh, <laughs> my, my first response I, was bad dog, but no. Um, yeah. The, <laughs> it's, you know, what, what, what I, and I actually had this conversation not terrible, it wasn't quite the scenario that you played, but it was close enough. Right. Was, you know, 20 years ago, you could, you could make an honest argument that maybe everybody didn't know how it worked, right? Like maybe the investors would say, well, I don't know, like, does the university own this? Do they even care? And the faculty would say, ah, they told me it was fine, right? You would move about the cabin uh, as appropriate, right? Well, everybody kind of knows how it works now. And the thing I always point to is the success of the data. So I always share the autometrics. Yeah. And to let faculty know, look, the investors are going on and on and out. Do you have clear title? Is it okay that you do this? Do, are, you, are, you, are you authorized to yes. pursue the thing that you want? So all roads kind of lead back to the IP owner because there needs to be clear title and there needs to be a license and everybody yeah. needs to know that that investment is going to support something. So I just kind of, I, I don't try to like, you know, you never, my, one of my jokes is you never win a head-on collision with a faculty member because, you know, it's just not, you're, you're speaking different languages, right? So yeah. I just try to say, you know, they're going to ask you to come back. Here. They're going to ask to make sure the university is okay with that. It's much easier if you just work with us directly. We're reasonable. Again, you can look at the outputs of the office and know we do this a lot and we're very successful at it and there's great outputs. So this, this shouldn't really be that hard. It doesn't mean we all agree, but I think as long as we agree on the core principles of why we're doing the work, which is to get science into the community to improve human health, it, we are all aligned in, in, at the end. Yeah, well, I don't, think, I don't think you have to look very far, um, maybe over the last 10 days for news reports of invalidation of IP <laughs> rights at yeah. the university level. Um, and everyone thought they knew that they had clear title at that point, right? Well, um, yeah. Derek made the joke about the Nobel Prize. So yeah, yeah. Charpentier and Duna got the Nobel Prize, but they didn't get the light. They didn't get the idea yeah. for that part. They did not. So the advice is not to try and do an end run when you don't know if you have clear title. That's right. Right. Yes. And we're really, that's our job is to, yeah. is to, you know, know, know each piece of the puzzle and do it well. And I think we do. Yeah, well, we, yeah. we agree and we appreciate, Mark, your time um, and certainly all that you and your team do for our New York biotech community. Um, it's very clear today um, the depth which you all participate in our ecosystem and we look forward to, as you said, when we're, we can do things in 3D, seeing everybody back in person at some event soon. Yeah. Well, so, I appreciate the right, time. It was, it was a great invite and it was fun.
All right, thanks, thanks so much, Mark. This is awesome. All right. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.